All right, so let's finish this up. We're going to talk about lacerations, and I will definitely be talking a little bit about this when I see you on the Zoom. But all laceration is, is um, some of the tissue has torn um, in that whole vaginal uh, passageway. And you can read these. First degree, obviously, is not that big a deal. Most, most uh, first and second degrees aren't. Third and fourth get a little dicey. Fourth, as you can see, it's all the way through the anterior rectal wall. It's um, a nightmare for people. I can honestly tell you, with my first, I had a fourth degree. And this baby wasn't huge. My son was 5'15", so barely six pounds. Um, but they um, were doing episiotomies in the 80s, left and right, uh, because they just figured it would help the baby come out a little bit. And episiotomy is where they're just going in and excising part of the tissue. But what they have found over time, and watching, of course, thousands and thousands of women, is that when you do an episiotomy, it's like tearing a piece of paper. You already have a tear. So if the woman's going to tear and you've already made a laceration, isn't it going to get bigger? Of course it is. So again, I will demonstrate what I'm talking about at, in, the, um, in the Zoom session that we have. However, um, um, now most women are having first and second degrees because they no longer, uh, the research has shown that they don't just automatically do episiotomies and they have found that we really don't need them. It causes worse tears. And, and the so what factor is when we have worse tears, um, we have more infection and we have longer recovery for women. So now moving on to the adaptations to pregnancy. So for women, a cardiac output, we know um, it's higher throughout pregnancy. A slight enlargement of the heart, they basically said, goes up to 12%. Uh, systolic and diastolic murmurs are very common uh, with women who are pregnant. Our red blood cell production escalates approximately 33% which is about 450 cc's, and it's like, that's substantial. That's like a small uh, IV bag of fluid. Um, white blood count goes up. Um, we know normal is 5 to 12, very, very normal in pregnancy to have a higher white count, but they're almost in a leukemic condition, meaning there are not a lot of baby blasts floating around like in leukemia. However, the white counts that are elevated don't help them that much. So they're more prone to infection. That's how they're more like the leukemia. But it is um, elevated in pregnancy and they're less effective. Nobody knows why, a phenomenon of pregnancy. Uh, clotting factors are up. So hypercoagulability throughout pregnancy also, and that puts women at risk for thrombosis and if they run into trouble, hemorrhaging, possibly DIC. So bear that in mind um, that that can happen. Hemoglobin and hematocrit are actually drop in relation to the plasma volume going up. Hemoglobin um, lower than 11 is anemia and hematocrit is lower than 35% is uh, considered anemia uh, during pregnancy because we know it's going to drop. Uh, maternal supine hypotension and the whole reason for this is we have a large gravid uterus. Gravid means pregnant. Um, sitting on the ascending vena cava, making it very hard for the venous return to make it back to the heart, which can make uh, cardiac output and blood pressure lower simply because the blood's not coming back to the heart, but the heart's trying to pump uh, more blood because it's trying to help with the baby. Um, so basically, again, if, if that's going on, then people uh, or the nurses will have them lay on their left side. Respiratory system is really not affected that much at all. Um, it shouldn't be unless they have asthma. Obviously, if they can't breathe, it's gonna affect everything. If pregnancy really made people not be able to breathe and in respiratory distress, we'd have a lot more problems than we do with birthing kids. So respiratory system is not affected. It should not be. They're a little bit more short of breath as the um, around 36 weeks before they've dropped because of that big gravid uterus might be pushing on the diaphragm. But it's not anything that, you know, they'll uh, um, sleep upright a little bit or at a 45 degree angle. Um, other than that, they're okay. Urinary system, look what happens. Uh, again, biggest reason is anatomically where the bladder is and the urinary system is in relation to this giant uterus that's usually, you guys, the size of an upside down pear. And now it's as big as a small watermelon or a large watermelon, depending on how many babies are in there or how big the kid is. So we have the renal pelvis dilating, 
the ureters elongate and become torturous. And what that means is they're twisted. They're not like a straight line. A urinary stasis, stasis or stagnation because it's getting pushed all every way and sideways and it increase the danger of pyelonephritis. UTIs are very, very common in pregnancy, even early pregnancy for this reason. So uh, we have to, another reason we keep telling them from the day they get pregnant, keep your bladder empty. Go to the bathroom, you know, very frequently, every one to two hours and drink, 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 drink. We all know that's, I'm always pushing that anyway, but with pregnant ladies, yes, yes, yes. You have to drink, drink, drink. Sorry, guys, I'm taking advantage of that and having a sip of water here. Um, increase in urinary frequency is related to the increasing size of the uterus. I kind of just covered that. It's pressure on the bladder. Bladder is pulled up into the ab abdominal cavity by the growing uterus. And with that in mind, the bladder tone is decreased. So let's talk about the integumentary system is just like the uh, urinary system. Lots and lots of changes. So far, the only system not affected that much is respiratory. So cloasma, what is that? It's also called melasma, which is M-E-L-A-S-M-A. -A. Um, it's a blotchy brownish mask of pregnancy. And it's kind of like the lupus rash, if you've ever seen it, but it's brown instead of red. And it, like a butterfly on the nose and out on the cheeks. And this disappears almost as they deliver. So it's, I, it's not that common. I haven't seen it that much, but it's definitely noted that it does happen. Linea nigra is extremely common in the Hispanics, some of the Asian cultures, um, where it's a dark line from the umbilicus all the way down to the symphysis pubis area. And it a lot of times does not go away. And neither does striae. People, women hate, hate, hate striae gravidarum. Um, what that is, it's another word for stretch marks. And it's due to connective tissue fragility. And it can be, I've seen uh, abdomens look like roadmaps from this where they just don't go away. It literally is like a pigmented roadmap in your, in your abdomen. And um, it can be on the breast though. It can be on the thighs and the inguinal area. A lot of areas that stretch you can end up with these stretch marks or striae. Um, oh, I've got it listed up there. Okay. And then musculoskeletal system, again, I, um, I wish I could model this for you, but lordosis, you guys, is when you lean way back and you see that. We call it the pregnant waddle. You'll see them in the mall. You'll see them walking in the park, or we used to see them. I'm so sorry for what we're all going through right now. Um, but anyway, where they're leaned back, and the reason they're leaned back and they've got this huge... Uh, um, uh, gut because of the baby that's growing and again this is going to be in the third trimester you're not going to see this in the first or second trimester um, second trimester maybe if they're carrying multiples at any rate um, they're doing that because the center of gravity is all off if they stand up straight they may fall over because of the big gut so a normal finding of pregnancy um, with the general body systems and of course this isn't with skin this is musculoskeletal is lordosis um, Distension of the abdomen and a shift in the center of gravity. That's what it's because. Relaxation and increased mobility of joints occur because there are hormones that actually um, help with the posture. It's called relaxin, just like you're relaxing with an N next to it, R-E-L-A-X-I-N, and progesterone. They lead to the charis, uh, characteristic waddle gait. The endocrine system obviously is going to take a huge hit and change all over the place. Uh, we know the anterior lobe of the pituitary actually becomes enlarged. So there you go. It's got the FSH and LH production is suppressed. Human placental lactogen. HCG production is suppressed at the delivery and afterwards. And we know HCG, human granatotropin, which actually tells us a lot of times that people are pregnant. It starts relaxing once the uh, placenta takes over. Prolactin is also found in the anterior lobe. It's a hormone for breastfeeding. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, prolactin and um, oxytocin are in the posterior lobe in the, for breastfeeding. Oxytocin production gradually increases as the fetus matures. Obviously, it's the one that gives the signal um, for the uterus to empty out its contents. Thyroid gland, what do you think? Production increase or decrease? 
I would say it increases because we've got um, the metabolic rate of the mother. The pulse is up a little bit with moms because they're actually helping to grow this fetus. Uh, parathyroid gland, definitely. We know it's the calcium king for calcium metabolism to meet the demands of the growing fetal skeleton, definitely increased. Pancreas, insulin production throughout pregnancy to compensate for the placental hormone insulin antagonist. And our insulin antagonists that are produced, the placenta becomes an endocrine gland and um, it secretes both estrogen and progesterone. And again, progesterone is the hormone of pregnancy. And adrenal cortisol, uh, decreased tissue sensitivity or the ability to use insulin. So the pancreas, we say, is basically diabetogenic. It actually helps women become diabetic because uh, it's an insulin antagonist. Not because it means to be, but just because the hormones that it does elicit um, don't want insulin in. And so definitely the pancreas is overworked. Um, Women with poor pancreatic function might develop true diabetes during pregnancy, or it's an indicator that they will become a diabetic um, five years, within five years after pregnancy. And again, adrenal glands, a little change, except that the adrenal cortisol decreases tissue sensitivity or the ability to use insulin because it's following the pancreas. Uh, the gastrointestinal system, progesterone we know diminishes peristalsis uh, throughout, so that's why there's constipation, hemorrhoids associated with constipation, heartburn, slowed gastric emptying, all to do with progesterone, but we need progesterone to stay uh, pregnant. So everything is affected. Um, we know variations in prenatal care. Obviously, if we've got many fetuses in there, there's going to be some differences. Twin pregnancies often end in prematurity, but not all the time at all. Uh, can be rupture of memories before term is common. It's just like the mom's body can't do it anymore. And this is interesting to know. Congenital malformations are twice as common in monozygotic twins as in singletons. And monozygotic, it means identical. No increase in incidence of congenital anomalies in dizygotic twins. So when they're fraternal, it's just like a brother and sister. But interesting to note, I did not know that until um, I started teaching, and I've seen many, many uh, different sets of twins born. Um, probability for multifetal fetal pregnancy does come in uh, hereditary lines, but not necessarily. I can't tell you how many sets of twins I've seen born, and they'll say, um, no, there was no twins anywhere. Um, use of fertility drugs, obviously, yes. Um, let's see. And multiple newborns can place strain on finances, space, workload. That all makes sense. And I think that's it. Okay. End of that. And um, hopefully I will be seeing you very soon. Bring your questions with you. Uh, and I hope this was helpful. Have a great day. Bye-bye.